welcome to the Psychiatry and Psychotherapy Podcast. I'm here to talk about getting rid of burnout, increasing job satisfaction, and feeling like an expert in what you do. One thing that created a lot of burnout and angst for me was trying to get continued medical education right at the last minute. So why not join the CME membership and do CME while listening to this podcast? Go to psychiatrypodcast.com, sign up, sign in, take the test, and the certification is emailed to you in seconds. All right, welcome back to the podcast. Today, I am joined with the same group that did the Big Five Agreeableness, and we are doing Big Five Extroversion. Okay, so this is a really, really fun topic. Um, Extroversion over the life course, genetics, neuroanatomy. We're going to talk about high and low and how that relates to careers, how you might, um, how that relates to relationships, behavior interactions, pathologies, psychotherapy, you know, how we might interact with someone who's high or low for psychotherapy. So joined with me is Ryan Hollis, Adriana Alvarez, Carl Wallenkampf, and Kyle Logan. Ryan did the majority of the digging on this, and then we all kind of came together to get this done. And so, um, Ryan, take us a little bit into the introduction. Right. So I think I'll just dive right into some of the traits that we're looking at for high and low scores of extroversion. So extroverts, they like people, prefer large groups and gatherings. They're usually a bit more assertive, active, talkative. They like excitement and stimulation. They tend to be a little bit more cheerful in disposition. Whereas the low scores, a little bit more reserved, independent, even-paced, prefer to be alone. And, you know, they're not exuberant as the extroverts, uh, but it doesn't necessarily make them unhappy or pessimistic necessarily. Yeah, that's really good. Okay. So to really help you understand this, we're going to go through how we scored and we're going to go through the domains. And so hopefully this is helpful to give you guys a really sort of more tangible working idea of what this construct really is. And so these domains are used in the most extensive versions of the Big Five personality type. And we took that big extensive version. And so let's start with the first domain. Right. So the domains are warmth, gregariousness, assertiveness, activity, excitement seeking, and positive emotions. Um, Kyle, would you like to start us off with warmth? Warmth is the facet of extroversion most relevant to issues of interpersonal intimacy. So someone scoring high in extroversion, uh, they smile easily, outgoing with strangers, strong emotional attachments to friends, enjoys talking to others, likes most people they meet, takes personal interest in others. So one of the strengths of someone high in warmth is they're warm and friendly. Someone low in this facet, they do not enjoy chatting with others, They can be perceived as cold and distant. And a strength of being low in warmth could be they do not hastily invest in non-reciprocal relationships. Yeah, so let's see, how did we score? I scored about two standard deviations above the mean, so I scored very high in warmth. Would you say you hastily invest in non-reciprocal relationships? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> probably probably but i think as um yeah i i would i probably gotten better at that like looking for how to make things reciprocal but i mean it's not always going to be reciprocal you mm-hmm. know like i think a lot of times you know you you give and you hope that that like helps someone grow and helps someone become a better person and that's good if that's accomplished. Yeah, what do you think, Kyle? Do you think I'm uh, high in warmth? I think you're high in warmth. I think, you know, the podcast is evidence of that. You're always talking to new people and um, very interested in them. Yeah. One of the things um, that's happening in my personal life is I'm moving. I'm moving to Florida. And um, in this process, I'm realizing how many people I'm connected to here in California. And it's, it's, um, it's a, it's a big thing. It's a big thing to say goodbye to so many people that you're like connected with, even if it's like, you know, you're only slightly connected with them. Like my coffee guy, you know, like we talk once in a while, but it's not like we're really close. Um, yeah. Adriana, I saw you were very high in this one as well. Yeah. Um, so I, 
I really am the kind that um, I have extremely strong attachments to my friends, especially that has gotten me, you know, into hot water in the past with non-reciprocal relationships. But I feel like that is a very small percentage. Most of the time, I have a very strong group of people around me to support me and I support them. Um, And that's like probably like my favorite thing in life is just spending time with friends and family and um, making those attachments stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why I enjoy more of outpatient psychiatry because I get to build those long-term relationships and um, why it makes moving so hard. (laughs) So I have to say goodbye to like people I've been working with for like literally 10 years. Okay. Holus, you scored a little high, like one standard deviation above the mean. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, I'm like pretty open to new relationships. I love talking to new people, pretty much like everyone I meet, generally speaking. So I think that's definitely pretty accurate. And Kyle, you scored half a standard deviation above the mean. It's not as high as us. But I would say you're warm. Yeah, I think I'm warm too. Probably because <laughs> you're critical of yourself. <laughs> Probably because you're a little critical of yourself. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. And Carl, you scored um, one and a half standard deviations above the mean. So you scored pretty high. I think so. I think I'm pretty warm with people and try to be really friendly with them. You're very you're very extroverted mm-hmm. like in how you like communicate with strangers and... Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I often try and connect with random strangers. Right. I'll make a joke to someone if we're on a subway together or things like that. Yeah. About how awkward it is when people talk on subways. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. I don't think there's a week I go by without like getting connected with new people. So it's like there's a there's a real joy in that, I think, for me. I think for me there's like a certain like rush when I can make a stranger laugh, like that is like one of the most like gratifying mm-hmm. things to me is like, yeah, like Carl said, like if I can crack a joke and a stranger laughs, like, yes, nailed it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I know for sure. Um, long before I ever got to know Carl a little bit, be- Carl a little better uh, during the podcast here, he would always do stop and chats <laughs> and, um, you know, always remembered my name and everything like that. Very, very warm, very warm. Okay, let's go on to number two, gregariousness. Who's going to tell us about gregariousness? Adriana? Yeah, so uh, gregarious uh, people, you know, generally really enjoy the company of others and the more the merrier. And people who are lower tend to not seek um, social stimulation or they'll actually try to avoid it sometimes. So these are the people that are low might prefer working alone, doing things alone. They somehow find social gatherings to be boring, which to me, like, it just does not compute. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But some of the strengths of this might be uh, they can benefit from alone time and uh, quiet contemplation. But people that are high in gregariousness like to be around people, enjoy parties with lots of people, yearn for others if they're alone too long, and might you know, enjoy being in spaces where there are a lot, a lot of people like popular beaches, things like that. So these people can kind of bring a refreshing energy to a room. And that would be a strength that I would point out. Yeah. So people who are low in this um, actively avoid social stimulation. So, you know, if you've scored low in being an extrovert and you've scored higher in being an introvert, that doesn't mean that you are low in gregariousness or low in this sort of idea of extroversion. So I just want to put that out there. You really have to take the test to see where you score compared to other people. Um, How did I score? I scored very high, like two standard deviations above the mean. Not quite as high as you, Adriana. Yeah, I scored very high. My score was 72, (laughs) um, which I think is extremely accurate. Um, I love to be around or as I like to say, I want to be where the people are. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yep. that's very much me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the more the merrier. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My wife who scores probably a little bit average on this. She likes to have like birthday party with like one couple. She'll pick one couple 
you know, we're going to go out to a nice dinner. I, I would prefer to have like all of my friends I could possibly get in the same place. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, yeah, that's, that's me being high in gregariousness. Um, I think I can remember times in my life where I wasn't around a lot of people and how hard that was like studying, oh. like when you're like studying in a, um, a cubicle and you're just like, you know, from six in the morning till 10 at night, you know, medical school, just like in the books, not, not fun. PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. not fun. Third year was yeah. a lot more fun for me. There's like teams, there's like, you know, you're interacting with nurses, with social workers, with like other residents and attendings. That was a lot more fun for me. Yeah, I'm about one standard deviation above the mean, and I definitely agree. Uh, first two years of medical school were pretty rough for that same reason. I found that actually being alone was, you know, not good for my productivity mm -hmm. because I needed the people to motivate me to study. You know, I could study as long as I was around people and they were also studying. But like if I was at home, I'm like, I don't want to do this. Mm. Like I don't have the motivation to like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's that's a good um, that's a good point. And, you know, a lot of these people who are higher in gregariousness in COVID season are just like really suffering. Right. They just have a hunger to interact. And if like me as a psychiatrist is the only person that they're like interacting with, then it's like really, really intense. Like you feel that, right? And so if you're a provider out there and you're listening to this and you have gregarious patients and you feel drained by the end of the day, maybe you're average, you know, or maybe you are gregarious, but it's just a lot to have that sort of gregarious hunger, right? <laughs> For like human contact. Kyle, uh, you were, I think, average on this? Yeah, I scored half standard deviation above. I, I like people. I like hanging out. I do enjoy personal time as well. So I think I'm average. Would you like big groups or small, small groups? Do you think? I like small groups better. I would okay. say. And then, um, Carl had the same score as me 55. Yeah. I found this interesting. I think it's because I was kind of middle of the road in the test on talking about times when I like to work alone versus being around other people. Um, I love, big parties. I love being around other people and I feel a lot of energy, but I do find that I'm often kind of fatigued at the end of the week based on a lot of people time. And when it gets to the weekend, I'll often want to just kind of be by myself for significant periods of time, just reading or, you know, watching TV by myself or yeah. writing. I think this shows that like you, the way that I see you, it, Carl, is like you're very... Um, you're very outgoing. You like to be around people. You have like that sort of energy around people. So you can have that, right? And still be lower on this because it's not like necessarily energizing. It's not like maybe it's life-giving, right? To Or it maybe is a little bit draining after a while. Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely had situations where um, I invited a bunch of people over and uh, sometimes some of my closer friends who are a little lower on this get a little perturbed because I'm just inviting everybody I know and, you know, their dog and their friend and their, you know. Yeah, no, I think this is um, something I've had to work out in my marriage, right? Is that, mm -hmm. no, we're not, I'm not going to be inviting a ton of people over, which is why, you know, the garage gym is so useful for me because like, mm -hmm. I can invite people over into that space and it's not like it intrudes upon my wife's need for a little introverted time. Right. So yeah, it can kind of be a, um, if you have a, like a strong mismatch or even stronger maybe then you have like one very extroverted and one very introverted person. It's like, okay, how do you, how do you help them accept each other for where they're at? And maybe, you know, if, if it's a birthday, maybe the introvert, you know, makes that exception to like the big party and just goes through it with it. Whereas when it's like normal sort of interactions with people, maybe the extrovert says, okay, I'm okay with one, one couple we're hanging out with or one smaller group of people. So it's like learning how to sort of find those needs, right? Get those needs met. I actually found that, you know, after hanging out with a big group of people, it's harder for me to fall asleep because mm -hmm. I just have so much energy and like I just, I've, I'm living, you know? Right. Um, and it's it's interesting to think about the perspective, like, you know, a lot of people get really drained at, at the end of the day from being around people. But 
for me, it's the opposite. So, yeah, yeah. Let's see here. The next one is assertiveness. Assertiveness. Carl, did you want to take us through assertiveness? Yeah. So assertiveness is one of the subdomains of extroversion, wherein high scores on this facet are dominant, forceful, and socially ascendant. They speak without hesitation and are and often will become group leaders. Those who score lower on assertiveness prefer to keep in the background and let others do the talking. So those who do score lower, sometimes they have a difficult time taking charge. They'll let others talk before speaking up, and they may have the weakness of not standing up for their own rights. But the strength of being low in assertiveness can sometimes mean that you do not need to follow another person in order to be confident in their choices. They may not just go out and say them out loud, but they may be confident internally. High scores of assertiveness are often dominant and forceful. Uh, they tend to dominate conversations and take a lot of time in them. Um, and they're often labeled as leaders and confident in making decisions, uh, but there can be weaknesses in group dynamics if one person dominates too much through conversation or assertion. Hmm. Yeah, let's, uh, let's see how we scored assertiveness. Carl, how did you score? This, uh, in the whole big five inventory, this was my highest score of 76 over two and a half standard deviations above the mean. Yep. So this was my highest one out of all the other, even sub-demands of all the other big five. So to me, this makes a lot of sense. I think when I am around people, I am I really like to engage in conversation and talk and share my ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's been helpful in a lot of ways. I mean, I, I'm able to connect in that way. I think I really get my ideas out there and people will you know, sort of have to respond to them to some extent. But I've also found like a significant weakness in this in my sometimes interest and passion for a topic and my willingness to just go out and start talking about something will often push other people to the margins. Hmm. And I think has actually been dangerous in some of my relationships. Push them to the margins in what way? What does that mean? I think sometimes I'll just talk about ideas that I'm passionate about so much. Um, I'll give an example. In in college, uh, say in like writing classes or English classes, say in a 50-minute class, there were times when I'd find that I would talk for like 10 minutes, just my cumulative responses to the class time would just – because I really loved the material and I was really willing to just get out there and say what I thought about the reading and the ideas that we were talking about and then realize like I'm – I am actually in some ways weakening the ability of my classmates to engage with the material. Um, So I I found that to be kind of interesting personally. And so one thing I actually did was write down my, Hmm. when I spoke last and then try and keep myself from speaking for like 10 minutes. Like I just look at the clock, write the time down, just like, Carl, you got to stop, man. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's some good uh, self-control there. Yeah, that is. For your assertiveness. (laughs) Kyle, you scored. Kyle and Ryan scored low on this. Um, for me, like I feel like I can be assertive if I feel really strongly about something, but it's it's not like the most natural thing for me. So. Yeah, same here. Um, I think I would definitely prefer to let others talk generally, not because I think just mostly just because I'm I'm just interested in, in what other people have to say, maybe, and um, I think. Hmm. Do, is the podcasting um, pleasurable for you too? Yes. You enjoy that? Okay. I, yeah, definitely. Despite despite um, being lower on this, because like, I definitely see Carl enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm eating this up. It's awesome. <laughs> oh, man. I was going to start a podcast after this. <laughs> Oh man! For, for okay. me, it's it's easier to be a, like a more assertive on this kind of stuff because we we are doing you know looking through all the articles. I do have opinions here, so I feel like it's in this setting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interestingly, um, Adriana, we were talking about this earlier, and Adriana felt that she thought I would score higher on this. Yeah, I was I was surprised that it was low. I expected yeah. at least the average. Just you know, in having worked with you for a little while now. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wouldn't characterize you as, you know, 
low in assertiveness. You know, it's pretty. Ryan, this is where like, I feel like I want to get someone who knows you really well to actually do the test for you. Mm, that would be and interesting. And look at the discrepancies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I scored high in this. I scored about a little bit more than half a standard deviation above the mean. So not like incredibly high. Not like Trump, probably three standard deviations above the mean. <laughs> what do you guys think? Um, but I scored half a standard deviation above the mean. And yeah. What I was surprised. I actually scored higher than you. Yeah. On this. And I was surprised by that because I I don't think I would use the words dominant or forceful to mm. describe myself. Um, but I do really enjoy taking on like leadership roles and expressing my like opinions, especially if I'm really passionate about something. I'm the kind that will like low key kind of force it on people, but not not to a super extent, but I, I do really like to make my ideas known and make things happen. So I think that might be why I scored a little bit higher. But I was, yeah, I was very surprised that it was higher than you, Dr. Peter. <laughs> I what mean, you-, you are the psych interest group president. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was not the psych group interest president. Um, <laughs> I was the president of my freshman class. Oh, but um, yeah, I think you're being a little, a uh, little modest here. Well, it's interesting. Why? Why did I score so low? Then I'm. It's. It's. Um. Yeah. You know, has it? This is maybe I would score higher, right? Just like mm-hmm. Ryan would score higher if someone else was rating me on this. Mm-hmm. This question lets others talk before speaking up. That's my job. I like <laughs> listen to people professionally. <laughs> yeah, I may talk a lot on this podcast, but a lot of my, like the, the way that I believe psychotherapy is best done is that a lot of your questions are to express that you are listening deeply to someone. So in psychotherapy, I, I feel like I probably listen and let other people talk a lot more. So maybe that's why I scored higher on that one. And I don't know about forceful, assertive, like, like, I don't know, like there's something like a little bit negative in some of those words to me, you know, so maybe I didn't want to align with those words. Yeah. Ten, tends to do most of the talking in conversations. I, I don't think that in my normal sort of day-to-day conversations, it's probably more even with people who are my peers. Yeah, so maybe that's why I scored a little bit lower on that. Okay, did everyone tell their score? Who didn't tell their score? I think everyone told their score. I think we did. Okay, let's go on to the next one. All right, so the next one is activity. So a high score is more of uh, people who have more of a rapid tempo, vigorous movement, sense of energy, and need to keep busy. They lead fast-paced lives. A low score is a little bit more leisurely, relaxed in tempo, uh, not necessarily sluggish or lazy, though. So some of the strengths of someone who's high in activity would be their ability to be really productive. Um, and those who are low, their strengths is just to be laid back. Who scored the highest in this one? I, I think Adriana did. Yeah, Adriana. mine was about a standard deviation, or one and a half standard deviations above the mean. Actually, you know what? If you look at your raw score, Adriana, mm-hmm. this, this is something that's interesting. So going back to assertiveness, my score was 20, yours was 23. So even though you were much higher than me, it's, it's comparing against other females. Oh. Which I, I think probably yeah. leads like 23. So if you look at the raw score, you did, you still did, oh, Carl scored substantially higher than you on assertiveness if you look at the raw score. So the point that I'm trying to convey right now, sorry, that was a little bit sort of incoherent, maybe if you're listening to this, is that females and males actually have a different bell curve. So when we're talking standard deviations, we're talking about against your own gender. So, okay, let's get back to activity. So I, Adriana scored one and a half standard deviations above the mean. Right. Um, I think that's pretty accurate. I do generally like to be active and, you know, I feel like I have a lot of energy but I, I also do take time to, 
I think in general, I'm kind of phlegmatic and more on the laid back side, but there is also this other side that's very energetic and kind of anxious. And <laughs> so it kind of depends on on what mood I'm in, really. Okay. Yeah. I scored about one and a half standard deviations above the mean. And I, I definitely do not say I live, live a laid back lifestyle. I, I do a lot of things. So, yeah, are you guys surprised at that? Not at all. <laughs> no, they're not. No, they're not surprised. Let's see. Carl, how did you do? Yeah, so I scored 49, which average. is which is average. Right in the middle. Right in the middle. And this was kind of strange to me because I think, like, looking at the characterization of activity, I... I think some of my favorite things to do are just like sit alone early in the morning. It's dark outside. Um, just drink a cup of coffee slowly. That's how I spend my free time on the weekends. But like during when I'm trying to be high productivity, especially in medical school, I act quickly, move quickly, walk quickly, like try to do things fast with high energy. Um, a single point of evidence is that out of the, I think, eight glasses that my roommate bought at the beginning of medical school within the first year, I think I shattered six of them by trying to wash dishes too quickly. So I think that like, <laughs> <laughs> and I've broken like multiple bowls. Cause I'm just like, <laughs> just, I'm just control. like, I think that's more a testament to your strength. <laughs> of not understanding your strength. Huh? Carl so, is like this, like six foot seven, like probably comes from a family of, previous Vikings, like a huge <laughs> man. He's a huge man. So, I mean, there's just a part of me that wonders, like, I do think I do some things in a hurry that I should probably slow down at, and it's probably counterproductive to break all of one's houseware. But okay. All right. Yeah. Who scored the lowest in this? I did by far. I think um, I scored the lowest wow. that anyone scored on any facet. You out scored of all very of us. low. Like we're talking about like two and a half standard deviations below the mean. Yeah. Ryan is one of the most laid back people. I I know. You know, I'm not surprised so, by this actually. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. This is unsurprising to me as well. Definitely. Still gets work done. Well, thank you. Thank you. Really laid back. Okay. Wow. So what do you do on like a typical weekend? Like what does your dream weekend look like? I mean, I think because of um, things that we'll talk about in a minute, excitement seeking, uh, it might not be what's, what you expect from someone who's super laid back because I like love going to like concerts or, you know, something like super stimulating like that. But at the same time, like I just love chilling and just listening to music or even like listening to the waves on the beach or something like that. And that could be like just my enjoyment, just chilling for like an hour or more. Okay. Nice. I'm thinking life is going to change for you guys when you have kids, by the way. It's <laughs> <laughs> like sitting alone with a cup of coffee <laughs> in a quiet moment. Yeah. I don't know. I, d I don't think my kids will ever match the number of dishes that I've broken, though. So I, I still will try to be the remaining champ for that. Okay. Well, six glasses of a very high number, Carl. I think very so. Very high. For an adult, I think so. <laughs> I think you'll be surprised at the amount of entropy that kids can create. <laughs> okay. How did you score, Kyle? Uh, 54, almost a half standard deviation above. Huh. Okay. Yeah, Kyle, it's interesting that you scored pretty much average on everything here, except for, except for assertiveness, a little bit lower, only half a standard deviation lower. It's so not that lower. So these kind of all flow together for you. Yeah, do you agree that you feel like you're average on this one? Yeah, I feel like I can be laid back. Never will I be as laid back as you. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, oh, I need a, yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. We'll be hanging out and I'll just be like, oh, man, let's just chill. And he's like, no, I need to grapple like now. <laughs> <laughs> so that's fair. Carl, you got something? I just thought, I think it's interesting to see these things is is average because i i do see kyle like even while we're working on these these podcasts is like pushing the ball forward in very mm. very calm ways they aren't like overly assertive or overly 
um, demanding, but he just kind of keeps things moving Mm -hmm. and he acts with intention and I think creates a very productive environment to that. Mm, That's true. Yeah, I I I think that um, I would score you actually higher on this, Kyle. Yeah, I think you're actually like a natural leader. Just the way that you interact with people and you're very like supportive, but still have expectations. Yeah, and you it's interesting. You don't need to be ex, you know, high in extroversion to be a leader. Mm-hmm. There's actually a study of like presidents of Fortune 500 companies and you know, you would assume from how Harvard teaches their business classes that they're trying to produce everyone to be an extrovert. But actually, there's a lot of them that are more introverted. So there's this kind of extrovert ideal, I think, in our culture. Like, this is the ideal to be, like, outgoing and gregarious and, you know, but it's not necessarily what is going to win the race if there was a race. I think we'll definitely dive into that a little bit more later on. Cool. Okay, so next we have... Excitement seeking. Excitement seeking. Yeah. So high scores on this scale crave excitement and stimulation. A high score likes action, enjoys roller coasters, craves excitement, enjoys doing things just for the heck of it, likes loud music, enjoys sporting events, and a strength can be uh, they can bring excitement and fun into group settings and parties. A low score might not... enjoy vacationing in busy and flashy areas, avoids horror films. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) A strength could be their level-headed and uh, provides a calm nature to relationships. So Ryan scored one and a half standard deviations above on excitement seeking, but very low in activity. Yeah. And I see that sometimes, like, if if there's nothing planned to do, Ryan's the most laid-back person ever. Okay. But he actively wants to go do really exciting things. So it's kind of interesting Mm. for me to see this like interplay of like being very low activity and very high excitement seeking. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. How did I, I think I scored low. I scored half a standard deviation, but I mean, I don't like horror movies. I like vacationing in more desolate areas that are just really beautiful. I, I can enjoy roller coasters from time to time but i don't like necessarily seek out like skydiving or any of that stuff yeah for me i'm i'm pretty into most of these things not necessarily roller coasters because i have a fear of heights (laughs) but um definitely crave excitement love being spontaneous just doing whatever just because uh listening to loud music uh going to sports events all that kind of stuff just love it yeah I, I probably would prefer to be home watching the sporting events. Oh, no. Nope. If at all. I don't watch much sports. Carl, you scored average. Yeah, I think that's I think that's reasonably true for me. I like vacationing in areas that are, you know, maybe active, maybe visiting a city or something like that, but I really like focusing on beauty. As you were saying, um, I don't think I pursue things that most people would characterize as exciting. Like I really like reading and Mm. I like some sightseeing, but I don't need to go to like really energizing things. Now, perhaps uncharacteristically in medical school, one of my main forms of like entertainment was I'd try to go to multiple concerts per year. So I'd drive to L.A. for like concerts to see. Right, but what kind of concerts are we talking about here, Carl? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're going to be moshing at these type of concerts, are they? Well, well, I, you know, I went to some, I went to Odessa, like that was a, that was an awesome concert, very loud, a lot of excitement. So that was one of the better experiences I've had. Okay. I wouldn't say I do that very all the time. Good. Adriana scored pretty high on this. Oh yeah, this you, is, this is me to the T. Like if okay. I could live in Disneyland, like I would. Because that's just like that is my environment. Like this, the people, the the rides, the excitement. Um, I just I crave it. I love it. You know, I tend to gravitate towards. I I love like playing sports and everything, but I really gravitate towards, you know, more the extreme quote unquote sports like, you know, longboarding and like snowboarding and just recently got into rock climbing things things like that. Just you know constantly trying to like push my limits so i i don't really like horror films that was a very specific thing but 
other than that, I'm I'm always looking for for excitement and stimulation. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I think for myself, like for me to get excited, I could get excited over a book um, because I'm high high in openness. Like I can create the the sort of the fantasy the the you know of the book. I can create that in my mind pretty easily. And I think this is probably why like the research articles can be exciting for me. <laughs> you know, like honestly, <laughs> like like I like when we yeah. had like that like research article and agreeableness on empathy and stuff. I was like, this is really cool. You know, <laughs> Ryan's over here being like, uh, mosh pits are cool, but this, <laughs> this is work. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that. I, I, I think, um, if I'm not interested in the topic, it can get like that. But when it comes to psychiatry, I'm, I'm pretty engaged. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. What's the last one? The last one is, Positive emotions, Adriana. So people that are high in uh, positive emotions, you know, laugh easily and often are very likely to experience, you know, joy, happiness, love, excitement. Um, They're generally optimistic, maybe bubbly. And strengths of this is being, you know, cheerful and high spirited. So that's, I think, in general, the life experience that they're they're more likely to have overall. It doesn't mean that they don't have other emotions, but... Yep. And you scored the highest in this. I Yeah, I scored very high. I feel like I am generally pretty bubbly. I love to laugh and make other people laugh. Um, and I try to be optimistic, you know, as much as I can be, um, so... Ryan, you scored the highest in this. You scored two standard deviations above the mean. Yeah, I'm not not too surprised about that one. I think all my friends think they're hilarious because of how easily I just burst out into laughter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. This is fun, Ryan. I feel like I'm getting to know Ryan here. Oh, man. I, I can definitely see that, Ryan. Um, yeah, definitely. I don't know if I feel joy in my body, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I just feel bubbly all the time, man. Uh, cheerfully optimistic. Laughs easily. Okay, you scored very high on the laughs easily. Mm-hmm. I scored very high. I scored one and a half standard deviations. Not as quite as high as Ryan, but I scored high. Yeah, pretty optimistic. It's pretty pretty hard to uh, burst my bubble. Mm-hmm. Although sometimes I do. How'd you do on this one, Carl? I, on this one, I scored 64 standard deviation and a half above the mean. I, it's interesting you say, I don't know if I feel joy in my body. Like reading that line feels joy in their body. I think that perfectly describes how I felt. Like that's a Mm. line for me. I feel like I feel joyful. I don't identify with bubbly, Mm. but I, I feel like a deep reservoir of positive emotion. Mm. Like I just feel good about things and try to really preserve that and that it bursts out through a lot of laughter. I mean, my roommate, Matthew Hagley, has been on these podcasts before. We'll watch a TV show together. I am like bellowing laughter at almost every situation. And Matt will, you know, he'll have some little chuckles every now and then he'll laugh really loudly. (laughs) There have been times watching things when I'll start crying from laughter, just unstoppable. Mm -hmm. So I just, I love it. I deep joy. Yeah, I, I feel that. I feel that. Let's see. Adriana, you scored very high. Yep. And and then um, Kyle, average. Average. I feel like it depends on the day how I would answer these things. Like what, you scored half a standard deviation above the mean, so a little bit leaning towards, you know, yeah. these things. And uh, I don't know, though. I feel like you get excited a lot about things. I know. That's why I said, like, I think it depends on the day. Like, yeah, maybe so. I probably just was having a normal day. Maybe day. you you took this a couple of weeks ago. Maybe you'd be higher in this now yeah. after. Now that ERAS is sent, oh, I feel way better. Yeah, how does that feel, guys? <laughs> does bubbly. That feel? Bubbly. Actually, I, <laughs> Comparatively, I think it's I do feel bubbly. interesting. The perspective, the word bubbly to me has kind of like a almost like a feminine like connotation, yep. and that might be why. Some people aren't um, as willing to uh, characterize themselves as that or not. Mm-hmm. For sure. 
Yeah. Do you, do you, does not like to use the words fantastic or amazing. I, low. Carl, I use those words all the time. Like fantastic is one of my favorite words. I use it in text all the time. Me too. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I need to be a little bit more self-conscious of the fact that like maybe this particular situation isn't fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, a lot happens in fantasy novels, right? So I feel like you can really use it widely. Okay. Actually, one of the the strengths of being low in this is that you are more realistic about, you know, the potential endeavors and disappointments of life. And it's not about mm. being in a fantasy world. It's about, you know, being in real life. Yeah, I have a hard time accepting that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think, um, I think like, you know, to realistically see bad events that are happening sometimes takes a little bit of a smoldering depression, you know, like a kind of a, like a dysthymia. Mm. Um, Winston Churchill, which I want to do an episode on him just because of the fact, you know, his, his history of mental health issues, you know, being able to see that Hitler was a bad character and that this was not going to go well for Europe. Right. And being kind of a siren to the society. And then you get like more optimistic people in the, in the culture saying, no, this is, this is, you know, this is not bad. This is going to be okay. You know, what are you thinking, Carl? I, one thing I like to think, you know, I, we, I want to legitimize myself in every way possible, but I feel like the joy in my body can sometimes react with ideas I don't like or think are dangerous to my joy. So I think sometimes like I'm sensitive to, oh, you know, I don't feel right reading this idea or thinking about this social change and it like causes my joy to warp a little bit. So I think sometimes there's a, there's a tuning that occurs there. Right. I think openness probably has a big influence on your kind of like acceptance to certain ideas and stuff like that. So these probably interact in some way. And uh, Carl was saying that um, sometimes his hit, the joy that he feels in his body is damaged by <laughs> damaged by ideas. So he doesn't want to be associated with someone who would be accepting of Hitler. I think is what he was trying to get. At. Oh, I guess yeah, yeah. So I guess I mean one way I might characterize it. I feel like the joy in my body is almost like a fire alarm, and there's a sensor you know, in my body that when like the noxious gas of a bad idea interferes with that sensor. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And the joy in my body like alarms. It's like, oh, this is a danger. Let me try to, let me try to get this. Are you saying like um, when you're like presented with the world and it's not as uh, cheerful and optimistic than you think it is, you don't want to believe that? No, I, th I think I think what he's saying, and I I feel the same way with Carl, is that like okay, I may be higher in this, but when there's a bad idea, you know, I think I can quickly be like, oh, this is, I, I can be like this. The propagation of this idea may be very very toxic, and there may be downstream effects to that. You know, what? I'm also not like overly optimistic about like life in general for most people. Life in general for most people is suffering. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not overly optimistic about my future being like, you know, it, I could die, you know, like I, I'm very sort of aware of right. mortality and I'm not going to do, do certain things, high risk things because I'm aware of my mortality. So it's like, I'm optimistic, but in a way I'm usually optimistic about people. Like I believe that people can improve, get better. Like, so when I have a really depressed patient in front of me, like I never like lose that optimism. You is, know. is that how you feel about individual people or how you feel about humans in general? Um, I think, I think humans will do horrible things to each other, you know, and that's the history of the world. Right. Um, and it's a tragic part of the world. Right. But I think that individually when I, when I'm working with someone, mm -hmm. you know, like I would like to believe, and I do believe that this person can make transformations in their life you know, even if they have had more darker moments or more darker thoughts, you know, like I think that this person could potentially, you know, improve and move into a better place. So I think that's very important from the, you know, the psychiatry standpoint. It's if you don't believe in your patients, it's a little bit harder to think that you can make a change and 
for them to believe that they can make a change. Yeah. And I fight against it in the residence, honestly. Like when I, when I notice any tinge of like jadedness that's sort of popping up, especially like there's certain populations, people who go back and forth through the psychiatric hospital multiple times, people who, you know, are, are, are sort of not improving. Right. One of the things that residents don't realize is that the, the patients that are improving, you don't see those patients. You, you'll see the patients, especially your first two years as a resident, you'll see the patients that are frequent flyers in the hospital. They're coming back. They're not getting what they need, outpatient. And I've seen a lot of these patients improve quite a bit. And so as an attending now with like sort of seeing the long, longitudinal aspect of people's lives, you know, I have a patient who was a white supremacist who was, man, when he was manic, specifically when he was manic. So when he was in a bipolar manic phase, he would get white supremacy tattoos all over his body. He was homeless. And now he's he's married someone of, of color and he's raising kids of color and he's got those tattoos off of him. And you know you would never recognize the person he's become. So I feel like whenever I see someone, I always feel hope for that person. And I see that where they could be. And I think that that hope really does help me carry through some of the darker, you know, aspects of people and their character. Right. So, yeah, I don't know what you call that. If that's realistic optimism, maybe it's not always realistic, but it's, I think it's the optimism that's necessary for the change to occur as well. Some therapeutic optimism, therapeutic optimism. Yeah. There you go. Coined a new term. (laughs) Okay. Um, Well, let's get into the bulk of this episode and believe it or not, we are now going to go through roughly 25 pages of single space notes um, that go through the studies of extroversion and will really hopefully now take you from like, okay, we understand what extroversion is to now, how does it, what does the science actually say about it? And the cool thing about this is, is they've been doing studies on this for like decades. And so we can just go through those studies and make you into an extroversion, extra, extroverted extroversion expert. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, so we're going to start out with Kyle talking about extroversion over the lifespan. And so what we know about this in general is that extroversion decreases. And Kyle specifically talked to us about this British study that was a cross-sectional study, a very large study looking at two different populations. Yeah, so it's over 14,000 participants. They found a linear decrease in extroversion over the lifespan with um, a difference of 7.6 T units, so 0.76 standard deviations between the youngest and the oldest, the youngest being 16 years old and oldest 86. And a similar pattern was seen in a a German population of over 20,000 participants and this difference was 0.36 standard deviations between the youngest and the oldest. Interesting. So there's a slight decrease over age, decrease in extroversion. This is a T-score. So with a T-score, a 10-point shift is like one standard deviation. So yeah, you're, you're right, Kyle. So this next study... This one's from 2006. It's one of the largest meta-analyses of longitudinal personality change. And it has 92 studies, over 50,000 participants. The meta-analysis used a modified version of the Big Five that split extroversion into two domains of social dominance and social vitality in order to increase the number of studies that could be included. And um, kind of the correlates of that, social dominance is equivalent to assertiveness, and social vitality is roughly... Uh, equivalent to like gregariousness, activity, positive emotions. So the meta-analysis showed social dominance increased throughout the lifespan up to the age of 40, then plateaus. And um, cumulatively, this increase was over one standard deviation. And the authors, you know, attributed this to getting started in your career, you're getting more uh, knowledgeable in college, and it kind of goes along with uh, getting ahead in life. You have to, you, you know, it's it's reasonable to think that you gain some kind of uh, assertiveness. 
And so this, social- is, this is good. Yeah. Yeah. Cause this is assertiveness that comes with competence, right? Yeah. Like I'm probably more assertive now than I was as a resident. And hopefully that's the case, right? Because otherwise you have a fairly um, overly confident, you know, person operating as if they know more than they don't, right? Sometimes the most dangerous clinicians or professionals are those that don't know what they don't know. And so, you know, as you gain more experience, you realize what you do and don't know, and you feel confident in what you do know. Okay. And then the, um, the other facets, social vitality, they actually had a, like a, a bit of a decrease over the lifespan. And this had most of the other facets in it. They had a, the two notable spots they decreased is after 20 and then after 60, another decrease. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you see a lot more activity in people in their early twenties, right? And then after, um, after the sixties, you have a little bit of a decrease as well in things like gregariousness, right? Things like that. So another, um, interesting finding in the, in the study is that males and females did not have a difference when it came to the, the mean change of, you know, social dominance or social, uh, social vitality. And this is in contradiction. This doesn't support Gutman's crossover hypothesis. He hypothesized that women increase in assertiveness, uh, throughout their life more so than men and men like men have a higher baseline level of assertiveness. And men increase in agreeableness more hmm. so than women okay. over their lifespan. So that's what he hypothesized, but that's not this, what they actually That is found. not what they found in this study. And uh, the authors said, uh, he made this hypothesis, I think, back in the 70s. And now uh, every co like the younger cohorts are actually more assertive than the older cohorts. So if you look mm. at the graph below, yep. and he thinks this might have switched that over because you know, there's more women in the workforce. They follow more similar uh, life trajectories. I think it's a good, a good trend there. Now, it is true, though, that the lower agreeableness males tend to, tend to use more of the domineering type of you know, strategies. And women in general are going to be a little bit more agreeable. And so that's where I think women need to train their negotiating tactics and learn how to be a little bit disagreeable. Yeah, it certainly looks like you can train assertiveness when you look at this graph and how it develops over your life. Just diving into a career, you you will be more assertive over time. Yep. All right. Yeah. So Ryan, tell me about the neurological base for extroversion. Right. So I looked at a study done in 2019 by Lee. Um, they took an MRI and a personality inventory. They took the MRI and personality inventory uh, first and then and then once again two years later and they found that extroversion had a significant positive association with gray matter volume uh, of the left caudate nucleus body. Um, this area of course uh, participates in the brain's uh, dopaminergic reward system and uh, of the facets of extroversion gregariousness and excitement seeking were the biggest mediators of the gray matter volume extroversion association. And it kind of suggests that caudate, the caudate nucleus might be related to the sensitivity that people have towards rewards. And it could be a structure that is critical in extroverted behaviors. That's, that's really cool. That's really cool because you think about like... Um... Actually, the thing that comes to my mind is like Wilbutrin, Bupropion, or giving someone a little bit of like, mm. like sometimes that elicits more positive types of, you know, enjoyment in things. So if someone's depressed, maybe the uh, SSRI brings them out of the depressed thoughts, but then they don't have those positive things. And so you increase their dopamine, norepinephrine, which is hitting those targets. It's increasing the the reward system. And so, yeah, I can see this in myself, higher higher extroversion and then higher um, rewards for things that may be not as rewarding for some people. <laughs> Did this like, article excite you or was it? I was pretty excited about this particular okay. one. Yeah, the caudate nucleus really, you know, it gets me. <laughs> Learning about the caudate nucleus, <laughs> activated your caudate, caudate nucleus. Okay. 
All right. Tell me some more. The other one I wanted to talk about was Schaefer, 2012. Um, he talks a little bit about extroversion and the somatosensory response. Uh, he explores the theory that the behavioral differences between extroverts and introverts can be explained by overactive cortical activity in introverts. And it kind of requires the introvert to constantly compensate for that overactivity. Um, activity in the primary somatosensory cortex was measured in response to non-painful tactile stimulation, and they assess personality with the five-factor model. So through neuromagnetic source imaging, they revealed that the less extroverted the participants were, the higher cortical activity found in the primary somatosensory cortex in response to the non-painful tactile stimulation. And this relationship was particularly valid for the right hemisphere of the brain. Wow. So that may, yeah, that, that also fascinating to me because you have this kind of increased lighting up to stimuli, right? To sensations in someone who's more introverted that they're going to look for less rich sensory experiences and they're going to enjoy those. Whereas, you know, maybe I can sit down at a coffee shop and study for someone who's really introverted. They might want like to be in the stacks of a library in like this very quiet, quiet area, you know, because they just are more stimulated by sensation in general. All right, let's jump to how extroverted people act in relationships. So to discuss how they act in relationships, um, I found a study by Tav uh, et al. in 2016 that examined extroversion and relationship satisfaction in college students. So there are two studies that were a part of this and participants completed personality tests and recorded relationship satisfaction. So in the first study of 206 participants, relationship satisfaction was recorded daily for three weeks and they found extroversion correlated with family satisfaction, R of uh, 0.22, friend satisfaction, uh, 0.33, and romantic life satisfaction, 0.19. And then the second study recorded relationship satisfaction twice weekly for two months and found extroversion correlated with friend satisfaction at 0.26 and romantic life satisfaction at 0.31. Hmm. Yeah, so a little bit, but for this initial study, the highest was friend satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you know, the more extroverted friend probably is more, you know, gregarious, more outgoing, wanting to do more. And then for this second study, interesting, like the romantic. Yeah, it took over. (laughs) The romantic part took over. Point three, it's not like a huge correlation, but it's there. Yeah, yeah. It's there. And, um, you know, you always hear about like people saying like, oh, I really want like a partner who's you know, outgoing, Mm -hmm. loves to do fun things, you know, like wants to explore the world. Right. Right. Those are all like extroversion ideals of that person. Right. And it might be that since the first study was over just three weeks consecutively, but the other one was more spread out, that might, might be a factor in, you know, how relationships have progressed romantically or maybe not, but it could be something. Okay. Yeah. What What's next? So additionally, meta-analysis done by uh, Heller in 2004 looked at relationship between personality and satisfaction in the domains of job and marriage and overall life satisfaction. So in the results, they found um, pretty sizable coefficients linking extroversion to both jobs. So job was uh, 0.19 and uh, marital satisfaction is 0.14. And extroversion was found to have a correlation with life satisfaction of 0.28. Hmm. So a little bit higher. With overall life. <laughs> a little bit higher life satisfaction yeah. in general. Okay. Yeah, any surprise there for you? Uh, for me personally, no. I think um, extroverts tend to uh, look for the most enjoyable things in life and really appreciate that. It's kind of like a seeking. 
Mm-hmm. So it, this this didn't really surprise me. And like whether they liked necessarily their job or their marriage, it's more like they're in life looking for the most stimulation and the most you know yeah. excitement. I'm looking at this and I'm looking at it with that caudate nucleus there, Ryan. And I'm thinking, man, that dopamine area, right? A little dopamine, <laughs> a little increase yeah. in those things, right? Yeah. Um, I'm also looking at this, uh, like the other personality types that we've already discussed, neuroticism with job satisfaction, negative 0.24. So the more neurotic individuals had decreased job satisfaction. And the other openness, it's like no link. Um, agreeableness, 0.13 conscientiousness 0.20. So um, conscientiousness is pretty similar to the uh, extroversion. Which I guess makes sense if you put a lot of your worth into your work ethic and getting things done and, you know, following that kind of regimented life. It's very conscientious. Uh, That's very much in line with, you know, having a job and (laughs) performing well in that. Marital satisfaction, you had neuroticism, negative 0.26 correlation. So once again, more neurotic individuals were not as satisfied with their marriage. Um, Extroversion, 0.14, so not a huge link there. Agreeableness, 0.24, conscientiousness, 0.22. So a little bit more with agreeableness and conscientiousness, not much with openness. All right, so let's talk about extroversion mediating followers behavior around leadership. Right. So I thought this was interesting. So what they found was in a study done by Manzani in 2014, uh, they examined extroversion and participants or the followers preference uh, between two leadership styles. So first was the authentic leadership style, which focuses more on relationship building and leadership, whereas the transactional style relies on compliance through kind of a rewards and punishment system. So in this study, they found that authentic leadership, which is more focused on relationship, gained the most loyalty from followers, and highly extroverted people were less loyal to leaders in general, and that was a beta negative uh, 0.18, and highly extroverted people preferred the authentic leadership style to the transactional leadership style. And that beta was uh, 0.37. So the really interesting thing that I saw from this was, uh, so being low in extroversion, um, there wasn't much preference for either leadership style. Hmm. But when you got high extroversion, uh, there was a strong preference towards the authentic leadership style. So overall, um, the extroverts were not very keen to um, responding to authority, like uh, leadership in general. But when they were highly extroverted, there was a strong preference towards uh, the towards relational style. Yeah. Towards the relational sort of leader, you know, to someone who is kind of like willing to engage them on a personal level. Right. Um, interestingly, in some management courses, they tell people to not make friends with people who work under you. Mm to not be relational, to be fair, to be fair. Be, and that's kind of like how they're, how different companies teach their employees to be. I think that's, it just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, like if as a leader, I can't be relational with people I work with, then I don't know if I'd want to do it. <laughs> you know, like if if I had a, a company that told me not to not to be relational. So I definitely think I probably focus on more of the relational stuff, especially with you guys. I mean, other than food that I feed you guys once in a while, but I'd probably feed you irrespective. It's not like I say, hey, you're doing better than the other medical students. You get dessert as well. (laughs) Um, So. Yeah, I I think maybe part of it is because maybe the more highly extroverted people do end up seeing the leader as like a friend. And so are more likely to be loyal to them and follow what they say rather than an actual authority figure. Yeah. Yeah. I think the higher you go up in leadership, probably the more that that stuff matters. Mm -hmm. Like, especially when you have choices, you know, when you have a lot of choice in where you work and what you do with your time, 
like unless you feel really connected with someone and you feel like they're going to treat you fair, you're probably not going to stick around. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's cool. So, you know, if you were listening to this and you were a business leader or into business and you had a highly extroverted person that works under you that maybe, you know, you could see this person venturing out on their own. It's your relationship that's probably going to keep them in connection with you rather than just venturing out on their own. Okay, let's keep going. So I wanted to talk a little bit further about life satisfaction, drawing a little bit off of what Adriana was saying. So we want to turn to a few other advantages, disadvantages of the spectrum of extroversion and diving a little deeper into life satisfaction. So Kim et al. in 2018 uh, sought to find an answer in life satisfaction data from Canada, the United States, United Kingdom, Germany, and Japan. As their premise, they noted how life satisfaction may interplay with personality. I mean, sort of the person environmental fit theory that a person who will have better vocational fit between environment and personality, and that can be improved if the personality and the environment fit well and are rewarding. Um, and their their well-being will improve if a situation is conducive to a personality type. So they were a little critical of some previous studies um, that correlated extroversion and life satisfaction as having small correlation sizes. Um, And then some of the uh, prior studies used only student samples. Um, I do think there's a joke that most of psych research is based on students in North America, you know, age 20, aged like 18 to 22, because that's most accessible for research. So they made that little criticism and sought to correct for some of those things. Um, And so they did five different studies. They looked at a Canadian student sample. Um, They looked at uh, two U.S. samples, both in students and in a representative national sample, and then samples Uh, from the United Kingdom, Germany, and Japan, looking representationally at samples from the whole country. And they found, again, that the beta or effect size of 0.2 was really kind of stuck around in all of these locations. So a positive effect of being extroverted and having improved life experience. But there were some interesting variations. So in the United States, the effect size was around 0.2, but sometimes ranged up uh, even higher and, and that was pretty stable. But then there were some declines as you go to other countries. For example, um, Britain had actually a fairly low beta of 0.126. Germany was 0.078. And Japan, Japan's beta value was 0.153. So smaller, still positive, but a smaller effect size between extroversion and life satisfaction. And the way that they kind of conceptualized it, they, they suggest that there could be significant cultural overlap between extroversion and how it improves life experience, noting that the United States and a lot of North America tends to be both very individualistic and socially mobile. So people will have a lot of mobility in their residence. They'll move around a lot, and they're very um, individualistic which means that if you're moving to new locations and required to be extroverted to succeed in uh, business and in professional lives, it is very adaptive and helpful to be extroverted uh, because you're constantly making new or regularly making new relationships to get further in your careers. Whereas in other places, um, for example, Britain and Germany, though they are still somewhat individualistic countries, Um, there's less uh, residential mobility at at times uh, was the suggestion they made. So possibly just considering kind of the cultural overlaps and what kinds of personality traits are um, like are good vocational fits and environmental fits. Excellent. Yeah. So basically with North America, you move around a lot because there's tons of different cities you can go to. Mm -hmm. You move to college, you move to this, you move to that. Whereas in Japan, Britain, Germany, you're kind of more geographically, you know, there's probably a couple different places you're going to be, but not too many. Mm-hmm. And then um, because there's more mobility you're and you're meeting new people and you're networking and that networking pays off, you may enjoy your job more if you are an extrovert in the U.S. There's also, you know, in this book, um, 
Quiet by Susan Cain, she talks about the extroversion culture in the US mm. and how that's sort of idealized with the individualism. And that may play a part as well, I think, in this. We wanted to move on and look at some other possible advantages. And this also has some job satisfaction um, effects here. So social relationships are an important way that we talk about um, extroversion and introversion, but also like um, effects in employment. And we wanted to start, I mean, I'm a medical student now, so this is really specific to me, but I think you can uh, do the dangerous task of extrapolating some uh, findings here. And so there is a study done um, by Schreckenbach et al. Uh, on fourth year medical students. And she and her colleagues studied 245 medical students in their fourth year of training, uh, coincidentally our year of training. And they assessed the students' personalities using an abbreviated big five inventory. Then they had the students take a, uh, an analysis, a test that tests for nonverbal um, accuracy of facial expressions. So testing the students for their ability to notice emotions and notice uh, nonverbal interactions. Um, so their, their ability to, to empathize and understand what someone's going through. Then the students were placed in a surgical, objective structured clini clinical examination called an OSCE. This is a, is a testing format familiar to students, but essentially these are um, cases where a standardized patient is used and um, students will come in and see these cases. And the cases are standardized among all students and often across schools so that you can get a good representative, um, a good representation of a student's ability to create rapport, do a clinical analysis through a patient interview and then debriefing with a patient. So they had these, these students, they got their big, big five and then assessed their ability to do empathetic assessments. Then they had them go through an OSCE and then they had the, uh, the standardized patients then rate the students using the consultation and relational empathy scale. So they had the, the um, standardized patients rate the students on their ability to empathize. And interestingly, they found that a student's emotion recognition ability was not related to the standardized patient's perception, and student's extroversion was not associated with a standardized patient's interpretation of their empathy. However, when they did a regression model based on um, when they put together emotion recognition and extroversion, they found that the standardized patients significantly rated those students as having higher emotional ability and empathetic ability. And the, the T value for that was 2.32, uh, and it was statistically significant. So they, they comment that essentially students who are both extroverted and are able to assess um, emotional emotions in their patients may have an advantage with patient uh, rapport building. And they hypothesize that this is because standardized patients, like real patients, often want empathetic individuals, but people who are also authoritative and able to take a sort of clinical role to say that are able to engage closely uh, with the patient and really be upfront and, and talk openly about things, but also acknowledge emotions. So hmm. they sort of suggest this. And I wonder, um, even though this isn't a medical student sample, I think that this is applicable to different kinds of trainees and it could be valuable for different programs. And if you're a teacher to think about your students and offering students who may not be as extroverted some tools with how to maybe appear that you are in order to get better rapport building with patients. Well, I, I think it would be easier to train the emotional recognition. Mm. Um, you know, micro expression, you can learn that in 10, 20 hours of mm. disciplined work um, through the app that I made, Emotion Connection. And there's studies that have been done, not on my app, but on similar things where it increases EQ, um, specifically in students who were already good at OSCEs, it did improve their score even more in one study. And in patients with like schizophrenia, it improved their social skills and stuff like that. When I train residents on how to recognize um, micro expressions, you know, we'll, we'll watch real patient encounters. Actually, um, Adriana got to see that yesterday. It was so cool. Actually, yeah, Adriana got to see that yesterday. And so what we do is we slow the video down, show the emotions, and then show what might be going on in the patient. The thing is, is it takes a lot more time to use it in a way that's therapeutic. And most people are not recognizing these things anyways. 
Like it's just going on so fast. So it could take months, I think, to even a couple of years to really learn how to use the knowledge of the microexpressions in the therapeutic context. But the first step is really to get it like 100% where you see it, you know what the emotions are. And then from there, it's like, okay, how do you use it therapeutically? That's something very challenging. So yeah, just some of my thoughts based off of this study, like, can you train gregariousness? You know, I would say even more than probably assertiveness, like gregariousness and excitement seeking, you know, just someone who's like present and just excited to be around other people, right? That's going to rub off in some, to some degree, especially with standardized patients. And then you can pick up your energy temporarily while you're around people. Like most people can. It's exhausting. If you're doing it all day and you're like an introvert, you're going to need some, you know, self care by the end of the day. So, yeah, I don't know about like training people to be more gregarious if like if that's like a uh, a good end goal <laughs> but yeah okay let's keep going uh kind of a fun study uh a possible disadvantage here to uh extroversion that links pretty well with what Ryan was talking about earlier with activity in the caudate nucleus and some differences between introverts and extroverts and their brain activity so Kilgore et al. in 2007 uh, noted that uh, there is some interesting research that demonstrates that extroversion is linked to basal activity in the reticular thalamic cortical loop. Specifically, prior research has shown that there are relations to arousal based in introverts and extroverts. Specifically, introverts tend to have higher tonic cortical arousal than extroverts. Uh, with a subsequent hypothesis that introverts may be more resilient to sleep loss than extroverts. That's what Kilgore et al. Um, hypothesized. So they studied a group, a small group of 23 adult military personnel. They gave them one of those revised neo-personality inventories and then subjected them to 77 hours of continuous sleep deprivation and then assessed them for v vigilance. Um, and then they they did a kind of double-blind simultaneous method where they gave half of the group caffeine to see how vigilance was mediated by chemical stimulation. And then they assessed vigilance uh, by giving them this portable reaction time test, sort of a handheld test where it tests your ability to react. So what they found was kind of interesting. As you'd suspect, uh, speed performance on their reaction time dropped throughout all sessions, sort of obvious. Um, and caffeine did improve the response times. However, extroverts declined significantly more in their speed performance overnight. Um, and that was a, a, a partial correlation coefficient that corrected for caffeine of negative 0.56. And subsequently, on, on later nights, introverts and extroverts did not significantly differ. Um, but this is kind of interesting just to think that extroverts on this first night of sleep loss are significantly slower in their reaction time than introverts. And they think that because introverts have this higher basal activity um, in the corticothalamic uh, loop there, that maybe they're better able to mediate sleep loss because they higher, have this higher activity there whereas, versus extroverts who have this kind of lower activity and so maybe a little more prone to sleep loss. It's a small study, but an interesting finding. It's interesting, yeah. Uh, if you have someone extroverted, make sure they're getting good sleep. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now, I I feel I feel more um, confident in my need for more sleep after this study. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I actually was a part of a study where they kept me up for a very long time during residency, and then they subjected me to like all these little like cognitive tests and stuff, and um, being sleep deprived is like, it really does change your cognitive function it, it changes your reaction time it's it's pretty amazing how much sleep impacts things and i have a lot of patients who come in and like the first couple weeks of treatment and my partial program they're sleeping like they tell me they're sleeping like four or five hours a night you know and so getting them that sleep early on even if it's through medications i think does help them absorb what's going on in class better, helps them be more present. So sometimes we'll add something and then take it away a couple weeks later. Okay, let's um, 
last thing we wanted to I wanted to talk about is a partial disadvantage, kind of a risk factor type of issue to think about. There was a study this year by Marengo et al. in, in Italy, and they looked specifically at neuroticism and extroversion and their interactions with possible social media addiction. So they used Facebook, passive Facebook user data, and they started with 10 students and then tried to kind of snowball a sampling method to a larger number through like an online uh, form. And they ended up concluding their study with over a thousand individuals and responses. Uh, Most of them were women out of about a thousand, over 700 were women, and about 81% were ages 18 to 25. Um, And then they had them do a brief personality profile, specifically looking at neuroticism and extroversion. And then they calculated the number of um, social media updates that were posted on Facebook, and then also the number of likes that those updates received. And what they did is they they used status updates as an indicator for a need for self-expression, and then the positive social feedback received as likes was seen as a mediator for uh, the need to receive positive affirmation. And essentially, they just made a brief comment that they found that neuroticism was directly associated with social media addiction, though not so with extroversion which showed a correlation with number of likes. That is that extroverts received more likes on their posts, which you could sort of intuit uh, based on more relationships. But they just sort of wanted to conclude in their their study that um, people who sc- score highly in neuroticism and extroversion may have a predisposition predisp- towards social media addiction simply in the need to post more online and the desire to receive more likes. So if you have a patient who scores high, just be aware that that could be a possibility. Hmm. So if someone gets a lot of likes, they're probably an extrovert. They could be. Yeah. <laughs> no, probably know a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> I'm they joking. also found that women received more likes in the study. Yeah. And also more um more attractive people receive more likes, right? <laughs> it's it's horrible. Uh what our kids are growing up in, you know, this like age of instant judgment. Yeah, it's pretty scary, actually. Like, if you ever watched the documentary The Social Dilemma on Netflix, that kept me up for days. Tell me, <laughs> what kept you up about it? Um, Just the statistics on, like, suicidality and children and adolescents. Like, that was very scary. How, it, how social media has influenced, you know, politics and uh, world events is pretty significant. Yeah. Um, just the fact that we're being manipulated in so many ways on such a constant basis um, subconsciously is like kind of, I don't know, it's chilling. Manipulated um, or is it that like, okay, so the way that I understand a lot of these algorithms is they show you what you want to see, right? So I had a patient who was a female who was like, yeah, I checked out his like Instagram. I could tell what kind of girls he was into. I'm like, what? She's like, yeah, I looked at his phone. I pulled up like, you know, that like little thing where you just kind of can do the random scrolling of whatever stuff. Explore page. Explore page. Yeah. So she pulled that up and she immediately knew what girl, what kind of girls he was into, which is kind of a, it's kind of a unique, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's pretty interesting. I was actually curious uh, if you have like particular rules with your kids about social media. My kids are not on social media. That's the rule. Okay. I mean, like they're I they're super like, young. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's uh, I think like if if you have like a good friend group that your kids have, and you talk to the parents and be like, hey, how about we keep our kids off of social media, like as a group? You know, that's probably the biggest win. Just wanted to point out that I was listening to um, an interview with Jonathan Haidt, who is a psychology professor at NYU, does a lot of research on moral psychology. Um, that is actually one of the suggestions that he gave in an interview is, is you really need to coordinate with a lot of other parents and kind of all get on the same page in order to present a combined front, which I think is um, an important point. That's interesting. You know, okay, so here's a couple of facts about social media, and then I'll get back to what I was kind of hinting towards about the algorithm. Only 5% of social media use is actually social interaction. So it's actually not very social. Most of it is for entertainment. That's mo- that's what most people are doing on there and comparing and, 
you know, it's a whole nother world. So the algorithm shows you what you want to see. And the reason why it does that for YouTube, for the social media, for Twitter is to keep you on their oh, yeah. platform, right? It's very simple. How do we keep you on our platform? How do you, how do we get you to give us free attention so that we can pop in an ad here and mm -hmm. there, right? We can't spam you that much, but we want to put ads in. We want your attention. It's all about attention. That being said, what happens, and I think they talked about this in the social dilemma, was that if you're into one type of thinking, because that's the way you're thinking, that's what it shows you more and more of. And then you become more and more um, polarized. polarized in one direction, right? So think about this with the elections going on. You're probably going to hear this somewhere bef before the election. Um, you know, are you in that category of people? who have over the last couple of years been pushed more and more towards one direction. You know, are you able to see both sides, right? And I was kind of challenging you guys earlier this week and some of you kind of like, I could tell like didn't like the challenge, but can you see why people are voting for the other person? That's the question. If you have, if you think that everyone else is voting for the other person and they're complete idiots, then you're not watching both sides at the same thing. Okay, which is like you're lacking, you're lacking an empathic immersion in the the other way of thinking about the world, right? And so what's happened is we've had two sides that have split further and further. Further, and um, the scary thing is, is is this may continue to go on, and what happens 10, 20 years from now, when you haven't been seeped in one side of the argument for five or six years, because that's about probably when this started. Mm -hmm. But it's more like 20 years, right? People think they don't know what's real or fake now if things continue on this road. It, here's some of the crazy thing. Like if you look at the people who are in doing some of these shootings, it's not like they're Antifa or in some like white supremacist group. They're a lot of times just kind of like not in a group in average but they've just kind of like drifted into one camp further and further, right? So that's the interesting thing to watch, okay? I mean, some cases it's like, yeah, you have these kind of more extreme groups who really, really believe what they believe to the point of potentially doing some destruction to property or harm to others. But, but what about the people who are just kind of in these sort of echo chambers and drifting slowly? And I see this in um, marriage therapy I do with couples. I see this in family therapy, like the family dynamics that are being created. And yeah. So anyways, okay. That's a little interlude. <laughs> interlude. Hopefully it was interesting to you. Yeah. I just want to give like a brief shout out to my high school friend, Gabriel LeBeau, who was the editor of our little high school newspaper. And in 2010, he wrote a little editorial article on the danger of search algorithms learning your preferences and then sending you down rabbit holes in search engines. So I just want to give a little shout out to him that 10 years ago, he was writing about this problem. Wow. That's really interesting. Okay. But let's talk about mental illness. So this is, I think this is the most interesting part of um, this topic for me. So I'll just kind of go through uh, what I found. So uh, Watson and at Al in 2009 did a meta-analysis looking at extroversion and the correlation with different psychopathologies. They found that extroversion was significantly positively correlated with histrionic personality disorder, um, and that correlation was 0 0.33, and narcissism. So in an older um, study that was in this meta-analysis, uh, the correlation was not significant at 0 0.9, but in three newer studies, extroversion and narcissism had correlations ranging from 0.31 to 0.40. They also found negative correlations between extroversion and avoidant personality disorder, and that was a negative 0.49, and schizoid personality disorder, which was zero, uh, negative 0 0.46. So if you wanted to completely avoid the narcissist, you could just look for someone like two or three standard deviations below the mean right. in extroversion? Is that what you're telling me? Well, you have to go searching because they're probably not out in the open. 
Where would I search for those people? <laughs> Probably like Maybe like a coffee shop in the corner. No, I don't not know. a coffee no, shop. No, not even a coffee shop. Not a coffee shop. Uh, uh, maybe a Dungeons and Dragons like <laughs> online chat room. Ah, uh, <laughs> see that social media right there. No, I no. Okay, um, <laughs> nothing wrong with Dungeons and Dragons for my fans out there who who like that. Okay, interesting about this is look at the correlation. This is not equal causation. Mm-hmm. You know, these aren't one hundred percent linked. So you could still be low extroverted and be narcissistic. You could still be. It it the the correlations are a little bit higher for avoidant personality disorder. Mm-hmm and for schizoid personality disorder, then, you know, those are like point, almost 0. 0.5. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty significant. And you think about, I, I think about those disorders as like, you're looking at someone who's probably two or three standard deviations below the mean in extroversion. And then they're probably, the risk probably jumps up way higher for that. Oh right? yeah. Okay, keep going. Um, so uh, this meta-analysis also looked at Uh, each facet of extroversion and the correlations of those with the different psychopathologies. Um, So histrionic personality disorder had the highest correlation with gregariousness um, facet of extroversion, which is, that was cool seeing like specifically where it hit the hardest, which is 0.35. Avoidant personality disorder and schizoid personality disorder had the largest negative correlations with uh, the warmth, gregariousness, and positivity facets, ranging from negative 0.35 to negative 0.48. Avoidant personality disorder had an additional negative correlation with the uh, assertiveness facet, uh, which was negative 0.39. Cool. Yeah. I. um, It's funny because I, I told you to look these up. Because I thought these would be actually the links that we would find, and they're the ones, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. Um, interestingly, you have things like antisocial personality disorder not linked one way or the other. Um, uh, you know, what is linked to negative extroversion? Social um. phobias, 0.37. Dysthymia disorder, 0.29. Depression, 0.28, panic disorder, 0.28, obsessive compulsive disorder, 0.27. So some of these more like anxious, depressed people. Um, interestingly, that, that narcissism linked, but not psychopathy and not Machiavellianism. Yeah, I thought that was interesting also. That's interesting because those usually run together. Right. Um, psychopathy, if they have low affective empathy, that's uniquely linked to psychopathy, not Machiavellianism and narcissism, then if they have that, then they'll usually have the Machiavellianism and the narcissism. Um, okay. That Great. might be because, um, well, I think this just points out how truly important agreeableness is in these, um, in distinguishing. I mean, all three of them have low agreeableness, yep. but the narcissist will likely be extroverted in that. Yeah, so narcissist more extroverted. Because, you know, you have the sort of that gregariousness. You're going to have other types of personality stuff if you're not extroverted. But it, the, the correlation is not huge. Right. It's like 0.3. So, Carl, just because you're the biggest extrovert here <laughs> doesn't mean you're a narcissist. <laughs> I, I would not say you're a narcissist. Okay, I just want to, like, affirm you in that. <laughs> One time my buddy... I was a little worried. One time my buddy called me and he's like, hey, do you think I'm a narcissist? Like, I'm just like really, really worried that I'm a narcissist. <laughs> what time of day was this call? What time of the day? Yeah. It was a normal time. I don't know. And I'm like, well, tell me more. Like, what's going on? He's like, well, you know, I'm just. And dude, this is the guy. This guy, like, he's very extroverted. Very extroverted. But he, he thinks about others like like that's what he does for a living. You know, he literally is in like full-time thinking about others type of job. And I was like, dude, you're, you're not a narcissist. He's like, usually narcissists aren't very concerned that they're narcissists. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the narcissist would be like, I'm not a narcissist. <laughs> like, like, uh, like, what are you talking about? Actually, I'm curious. Uh, what do you think the statistics are for narcissists in medicine? Uh, it's probably higher in certain jobs with low agreeableness, right? Mm. 
So like more of the, um, I, you know, honestly, it's the, the jobs that collect the narcissists are the jobs where you need confidence in the face of death, mm-hmm. like utter confidence. And so what, that's where the low agreeableness will be the most advantageous, mm-hmm. right? So if, if people are literally dying around you all day long, every week of the year, every month of the year, you know, like these are the types of fields that are going to collect people who are low agreeableness. Mm-hmm. And you know what? That's the people who are going to survive, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, like, you, like you think about all this. There's certain types of specialties, surgeons, uh, uh, you know, like subgroups of surgeons where you have more people die than usual. But that's going to collect the low agreeableness because those people are going to be able to tolerate just the loss of life more easily. So, well, yeah. That's a good point. What do you think, Ryan? No, that's just, that's pretty interesting. Um, I'm curious about what facet of agreeableness you think that like makes you, makes it easier to deal with that. Uh, low affective empathy, mm-hmm. specifically. So when you get more towards that psychopathy spectrum, you have very low affective empathy. And so you're not feeling into the, into the loss of, of other people's yeah. um, emotional worlds. So when you have the family just completely distressed, it's not going to physiologically translate from their brain into your brain. Right. You know, so the, the people with a high, very, very high affective empathy will feel into the other person's experience so much so that if it's traumatic for them, it'll be traumatic for me. But if, if, if you're not feeling into their experience, it will not be as traumatic for you. Good question. Ryan, uh, Ryan has a, that sort of desire to, to push against, to try to figure out things, you know? Appreciate it about that. It's my low straightforwardness, I guess, <laughs> again. I think it's good. I think it's good. Hopefully you feel the psychological safety to disagree. Yeah, I think I do. But my low assertiveness kind of messes with that sometimes. That's why I have to look at you and catch you in that moment, you know? <laughs> when you're like... You have that sort of questioning look. That's my effective empathy saying like, oh, Ryan's over there. He's got some like, got some thoughts he probably doesn't want to share. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. So uh, this next study, it's about narcissism and extroversion. It was too recent to be included in the previous meta-analysis, but it, it split narcissism up into uh, like grandiose and vulnerable narcissism. And... Um, the correlation was higher. And so with grandiose narcissism, the correlation with extroversion was 0.61, while with vulnerable narcissism, the correlation was negative. It was actually negative 0.24. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. I think, I, I okay, so the vulnerable narcissist, I call the chihuahua narcissist. It's the low self-esteem narcissist. And they're... Um, they tend to be, yeah, like a little bit lower extroversion, right? And very, um, they, they don't have that confidence with that like assertiveness and sort of dominance, right? Whereas the high self-esteem narcissist, okay, this is where I, this is where I, I, I part ways a little bit with Kohut, okay? So Kohut thought everyone who was a narcissist had low self-esteem. Uh, I, and I think that there are like high self-esteem narcissists, like there are the people who um, like underneath the narcissism is not the chihuahua. Underneath the narcissism is more like a pit bull, right? It's more of the fighter. It's more of like maybe could have been something like a tribe leader, right? And, you know, if they don't do their own personal growth and don't grow past kind of like being able to see other people's needs, be able to read other people, be able to to see that that, you know, well, let me let me say it this way. I've 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 had a couple of patients who are like in this category. And my approach is sometimes to convince them idea-wise that helping the greater the greatest amount of people will give them the accomplishment of their goals. So, I'm trying to move them from a mi- a, a mind shift, right? From the mindset of meeting their own needs only is like the end of all goodness, right? To like seeing that like the more people you help actually will give you the most satisfaction downstream. 
and and that takes a that takes time that takes time so sometimes in in this type of therapy it's a little bit less um it's a, it's a little bit more you're challenging them and they like to be challenged a little bit not too much but they like to be challenged if if you're too uh, passive then they just um feel like they can walk over you and they feel like like often they're not coming in for therapy initially they're coming in for benzos they're coming in for Adderall, right? They're coming in for some sort of like stimulant, something to optimize them, testosterone or something. I don't know. Not that not patients don't ask me for that, but that, that that's the kind of like mindset, right? Is vulnerable narcissism harder to um, diagnose? No. Mm, uh, I mean, it's it's not maybe the picture of narcissism that you would have based on pop culture. Some in pop culture, they call it the covert narcissist often. So it's like the secret narcissist. You know, it's the it's the medical student who's dating someone who has no time to meet their needs and they demand that their needs are met. And then they if they're with someone who's super high trade agreeable, that that they the trade agreeable person thinks to themselves, like, oh, should I be just like giving them all their needs and not meeting any of my own psychological needs? Um, so I've seen that even just the last month, you know, mm. um, not from you guys. Okay. From like, you guys aren't <laughs> telling me about your relationship. So I don't know about that. Okay. Ryan's like, are you talking about me, man? <laughs> single, single, single. <laughs> <laughs> You're single. Okay. Okay. So yeah, the covert narcissist, um, it's, it's harder for people to recognize if your dad was a covert narcissist, you may wake up a couple years into a relationship and realize that the person you're dating is a covert narcissist. Dun, 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 right? <laughs> That's mind blowing. Okay. Let's keep going. Extroversion and ADHD. Um, so this study by Lowe at Al in 2017, looked at genome wide analysis of personality traits uh, with six genomic loci. Um, and they found that high extroversion specifically uh, had a correlation with ADHD of 0 0.3. Um, so it wasn't super high, but I, I think it's still sizable enough to um, know. And to me, that makes sense because the excitement seeking and the, the high stimulus seeking, I feel like both kind of go hand in hand between extroversion and ADHD. 100%. And I would say if it's hyperactive ADHD, it's probably even higher oh, yeah. than this. It's it's the inattentive ADHD that might be holding it not back as a little extroverted. Bit. <laughs> um, but most of the true hyperactive combined type ADHD that I see, they come off very high extroversion, high energy people. If if someone seems very depressed, they're probably either the depression is probably the first thing you treat. And that might actually solve their attention issues. Mm -hmm. So keep going. Anything else from the study? Uh, I mean, the, the study covered um, an array of different pathologies. They're more of uh, other psychiatric disorders, such as bipolar disorder, uh, you know, major depression, things like that, but not they weren't as closely linked um, to extroversion uh, without other things. Yeah. So check out check out the handout. It'll show you all the details. Uh, we'll put the graph in. Let's move on to therapy for maladaptive extroversion. Ryan. I looked at a study from Boucher, um, 2019. It's a meta-analysis. So they did this study with the intention of finding the association between different personality traits and mental health treatment outcomes. Generally, higher extroversion was associated with favorable outcomes overall. They looked at a few different outcomes. Um, significant statistical heterogeneity um, suggests extroversion is positively associated with outcomes such as lack of symptom severity, symptom decrease, improvement, aggregated improvement, which includes things like their BMI, the weight gain, their overall improvement, symptoms, uh, lack of symptom severity, etc., and, uh, and also their overall positive outcomes. 
Extroversion also had the greatest positive impact on overall outcomes. And notably, um, extroversion was not strongly associated with better interpersonal outcomes. Working Alliance had an effect size of 0.04. Individuals are found to be more willing to participate and communicate openly and honestly in treatment. However, these attributes do not actually translate to building a therapeutic relationship. Coping skills actually had the highest association with extroversion, um, 0.11. And extroversion had the strongest association with symptom decrease, uh, 0.15. Yeah, there's either pretty small mm -hmm. correlations across the board. Yeah, but it's, you know, maybe when you're getting into two standard deviations or you're getting into like, it, it just doesn't seem like this is going to have that big of an impact on like if the therapy is successful or not. Yeah, they went on to talk about a little bit about uh, patient type, and uh, the, the correlations were kind of low here as well, but they did find that in the inpatient setting, uh, favor favorable outcomes were associated with lower levels of extroversion, and in the outpatient setting, it was higher levels of extroversion. Were, were associated with favorable outcomes. Yeah, so the higher extroversion associated with more favorable outcomes. So once again, that's a correlation of like point. One, one. It's a pretty small correlation. Right. And then also in treatment length, um, we found that it, with four weeks or less, there was a negative correlation the higher the extroversion. And when you went up to six to 11 months, you got a slight, uh, you got a 0 0.16 correlation uh, with higher extroversion and positive outcomes. Okay. Um. So now we'll move on to talking a little bit about maladaptively high extroversion. Uh, I looked at an article from Gore 2011. Um, so some of the things that we expect to see here are exhibitionism, gregariousness can unfortunately uh, lead to things like attention seeking and inappropriate flirtatiousness, usually in things like uh, histrionic personality disorder. Assertiveness can become pushy, authoritarian uh, in narcissism, and interpersonally dominant in antisocial. And excitement-seeking can become reckless and risky. Presnol, in 2013, takes us through some things to consider during therapeutic interaction and maladaptively high extroverts. Uh, he mentions that patients may present with long-term exhaustion of their interperson interpersonal relationships, this includes suspected infidelity uh, due to co consistent pursuit of outside social endeavors causing friction in their romantic relationships. Also, uh, he mentioned to consider the frequent comorbidity of substance use disorder secondary to their excitement seeking and risky behavior. Their propensity for social interaction could also rein reinforce their substance use. And in our differential for maladaptively high extroversion, we must distinguish these patients from bipolar disorder. You should be able to appreciate from the history uh, that the patient's frantic energy, thrill-seeking, and interpersonal dominance are not interrupted by periods of withdrawal and low energy. And furthermore, their symptoms will be confined to interpersonal relationships. Interesting. Yeah, I'm thinking from a lot of these things, because of how our society characterizes someone who's more narcissistic, people don't really think histrionic as like a category in pop culture. Like I don't hear that very much, but I hear narcissistic. I think someone who's very high extroversion, like may get sort of cast in that sort of picture. Actually, well, how do you know someone's a narcissist? It's, um, it's your patient's ex partner. You know, it's like, it's so pop culture right now to think that your ex was a narcissist that like, I, anyways, you, you guys have to be in the field to know what that means. Um, so it's like, I'm thinking as I look at this, okay, first of all, I, the, the link is there, right? Between narcissism, 0.3, somewhere on there, histrionic stuff, 0.4, somewhere on there. But that doesn't mean that you could be extremely extroverted and and have meaningful long-term relationships with people because you seek you seek 
their value intrinsically, right? And you want them to move forward in their domains of life and irrespective of moving you forward in your domain of life, right? So I define someone as a narcissist if they, in the end, like it's only about them. They're only thinking about their own moving forward. And those people will burn relationships out as time goes on. Someone is histrionic, like this, the way that they tell their stories is very sort of excitement oriented. Like I've never seen someone have so many just interesting explosions of interpersonal dramas, except, you know, someone who's really histrionic. And they use that to captivate people and to pull people into the story, right? So they're great storytellers often. I, I, I find it interesting in this article how they talk about how these people might be more people high in extrovert might be prone to more like affairs and more like substance use. Whereas if you look at the link between substance use and extroversion, it's not that strong of a link in the prior paper. So I think what they're sort of aiming at is more of the the pathologies that could be associated with extroversion, but not as not necessarily associated with extroversion. I'm also curious um, because I'm not sure how the the big five model takes into account disorders that are not personality disorders like, you know, ADHD. Um, so someone that would, you know, maybe score high in, you know, excitability and um, extroversion um, and maybe like high in impulsivity would come out to look histrionic, you know, on the test or something like that. But actually it's just characteristics of ADHD, which is a different type of disorder. Yeah, I think what you're aiming at is um, the specificity of the test, right? Uh, how often are we missing that this person is just highly extroverted, right? And maybe they're not ADHD. Maybe they're nar- not narcissistic. Maybe they're not histrionic. Maybe you have a highly extroverted depressed patient, mm. you know? And so I think this is where this construct of extroversion can really be helpful in like understanding people, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's like this bell curve of extroversion and they may not have any personal personality pathology in this domain, right? And so if all you see is um, histrionic narcissists, like all you see is the the personality disorders, all you see is the DSM, you may miss like these very normal places where it could be like a strength, right? Mm -hmm. So then do you pathologize gregariousness or, uh, you know, outgoingness? And that's, that would be, or, or low gregariousness, you know, or low mm-hmm. outgoingness. Like, do we overly pathologize it rather than seeing like, okay, this is just part of this distribution mm-hmm. in the population. Um, so yeah, what were you thinking, Ryan? I guess I was just thinking that, I, I guess I wasn't totally sure about what uh, the, these tests actually say about personality disorders. I, I mean, do they claim to be able to diagnose them? I'm, I'm, I wasn't really sure about that. No. Okay. Okay. No, it's That's just what I um, like the if you just take the big five, you're not going to be able to diagnose a personality disorder. But what the big five will tell you, and like when in, in the readout that I got, is like, like it says like your chance of having borderline personality disorder is really low because people with borderline personality disorder do not, you know, have the types of you know personality that you have, right? Or the chance that y- you would have something like blah, blah, blah would be higher, right? So it does give you that, but it's like, how how are those things diagnosed? They're diagnosed by a clinician. Mm-hmm. And if they're diagnosed in research, they're diagnosed usually by the SCID, okay, which okay. is a very detailed personality inventory. So the SCID personality, okay. which when I go through personality disorders in the future, I'll, I'll take people through the SCID and show it, show people how it's formally diagnosed in the research, which is really important because then you can look at you know, how then the studies line up with the gold standard of diagnosis and what that means. But yeah, I would always put it back on the clinician to give a formal diagnosis. Um, in your experience with borderline patients, um, have you have you found that they also are good storytellers like the histrionic ones? <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. The, the borderline patients can be, um, especially like, 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 you know, you talk to a person who's been dating a person with borderline personality disorder, mm-hmm. and it it can be very exciting. The attachment is can be almost instantaneous. The the passion, right? The 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 the, the 
person with more of a narcissism may enjoy like almost like a, a revelry that the person with borderline has. The person with borderline desires this deep attachment relationship, right? The problems happen in the future when the person with borderline personality disorder like has these darker parts of their um, trauma that then get sort of activated by the attachment. So that leads to things like splitting all are bad. So you go from being an angel to being the devil. You go from um, being all good and this glorious knight, this hero to being like this just horrible, horrible person, right? And and then it just takes you through that turmoil, right? Which can actually be a little bit seductive. You know, it can be like a little bit enthralling. It's not boring for any, by any means. It's evoking a lot of emotion in you. And I've had patients who go into conversion disorders over this. Like they'll be dating a borderline. And that is the only thing that I can find that led them into conversion disorder. Like straight up psychogenic seizures in and out of a hospital. And it becomes part of the borderline's way of attachment, which is with that partner, right? Which is very interesting. Okay, I could go more into that. Mm-hmm. Ryan's, Ryan, finally, I've, <laughs> I finally got Ryan's attention here. <laughs> okay, he's, there's the... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. No, it was actually a patient that I had um, that who just seemed to just like have like the most horrible life I've ever heard. And like he just it just seemed like every time I talked to him, there was some new trauma that he was telling me about. And um, I was trying to figure out where, like, you know, if it was gamey or, or where that was coming from. Well, OK. Yeah. So you're you're probably picking up something there. Because sometimes people who have been mental healthized, who are borderline, how do they get their attachment needs? By telling the same story over and over again. Do they actually get dissociated while they're telling you the story? Sometimes no. Sometimes they're telling you the story with a little bit of glee. I remember this, um, this person who gave a talk about her her horrible relationship backgrounds. And she went into gruesome detail in front of this audience of 50 people. And the audience was in this agony, okay? But I looked up at her at this moment of the audience being in agony and she was in revelry. She was in absolute bliss because she felt connected to the audience, right? So... Yeah, sometimes it's um, more than just a, more than telling you the story to overcome the story, right? Right. Sometimes it's this is how I get my attachment needs met, and so what do we do as clinicians then? Okay, what we do is we give attention to real congruent emotion, and so we look for it, and you may not find it for a while. But if you don't give attention to the things that don't um, evoke in them and in you, therefore, some sort of like congruent experience, then the question is like, where is the congruent experience? And so this is where I go back to it's either in the artwork, the writing, or the word written, or the words that are coming out. And for some people, it's only the artwork. And so get them to talk about their artwork. And then now, now they're translating congruent speech congruent um, artwork into congruent speech or get them to write about their artwork. Now it's translating congruent artwork into congruent words. Okay. So I could go on about that. Okay. All right. Yeah. Anything else from this episode that you wanted to point out? Um, Yeah. I thought that uh, he had some good suggestions about uh, interventions for maladaptively uh, high extroversion. Uh, he talked about providing frank interpersonal feedback about the about the thoughts, emotions, and reactions that are elicited by the client's maladaptively extroverted behavior, because usually these patients are um, egocentric, and this kind of gives the patient a chance to gain some insight into their personal issues, and then they're able to go from individual interpersonal therapy to group interpersonal therapy. And then once they're in that situation, they're able to kind of 
well, I guess their maladaptive behaviors are kind of drawn out in the group, and it gives them a chance um, with their newfound insight to sort of uh, practice how to con- how to confront those behaviors. Yeah. No, I, I, okay. So what he's describing here is someone who's higher in extroversion. He is going to tell them his experience of them, his interpersonal experience of them. So what is actually going on between them in the here and now, he puts words to that. And Yalom talks about this. And then what you would do in a group is you would do like a Yalom interpersonal group therapy as well, where then you would have the group members speak truth to their experience of this person. And the the group therapy and the individual therapy is a microcosm for life. So if this guy is pushing the buttons of everyone in the group, you can guarantee that's going on in every domain of their life, right? And so this is where that interpersonal therapy is so rich because no one gives them that feedback in a safe, empathic way, right? In a way that actually causes growth. They also recommend uh, cognitive behavioral therapy as a key tool key tool during this process. And also uh, mindfulness skills uh, would be another effective addition because it can kind of give the patient um, a way to acknowledge their maladaptive cognitions like when they're actually happening. Um, And also uh, behavioral goals of increasing alone time and or refraining from speaking for a proportion of a given interpersonal interaction can can be helpful as well. Carl, you were talking about that. Yeah, so that's kind of funny because that's literally a strategy I've used on myself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So, it's, it's, so this is for this is for maladaptively high extrovert. Okay, that's that's good. Yeah, <laughs> I I think I think um, t- taking being in being the one that gives therapy probably taught me this. You know. Um, taught me this to some degree it's like you're you're practicing a meditative stance listening to someone else over and over again and you're trying to subvert your own needs right your own sort of desires to the person that you're actually listening to okay yeah let's talk about maladaptively low extroversion what do we do with us all right so usually in uh maladaptively low extroversion This is like a patient who's a little bit more familiar to clinicians, shy, introverted, um, kind of loner. Um, They don't really have too many feelings towards the majority of activities and relationships. The things that uh, Presnell suggested for for this uh, therapeutic interaction um, was to consider that they do have an increased lifetime risk for social phobia, major depressive disorder, and schizophrenia. And um, and their prognoses in these can actually be a little bit poorer um, just due to their lack of social support. Um, as well, they should begin with individual and move into group interpersonal therapy. And this is so that the provider can make a concerted effort to establish trust and alliance with the patient. So um, they can then discuss group therapy once that's started. And um, something to note is that... Uh, during interviews with these patients, you can't assume that these maladaptively low extroverts will volunteer even important information. Uh, so sometimes you have to ask more specific questions and not ask as many open-ended ones. Behavioral therapy and skill training are effective therapy modalities in this population. Uh, this therapy should be informed by the provider's understanding of the specific deficits in extroversion that are hindering the patient's function, as well as the factors reinforcing them. Uh, And in order to obtain that information, uh, you can have the patient undergo a five-factor model assessment followed by functional behavioral analysis. Interpersonal and behavioral therapies may be supported by pharmacological treatment. Uh, This is uh, article Tang et al. 2009. They performed a placebo-controlled test in which adult patients with moderate to severe major depressive disorder received placebo, or they received uh, paroxetine or cognitive therapy. And what they found was that um, with an effect size of 0.63, paroxetine increased extroversions significantly more than placebo. 
and this can be crucial in helping these patients establish new healthy behaviors. Huh, that's interesting. Yeah, and it just goes to show that treating the depression can move someone to being from being like internally, like like the the final common pathway of someone who's depressed is to not go out very much, to be isolated, to not interact with a lot of people. So it it seems to me that like actually treating the depression increases the extroversion. Yeah, and that's interesting. I I knew I should have um, read the other article about this because um, I just read a little bit of it and they were trying to say actually that um, the extroversion increases independently from the depression treatment. Um, Yeah, so it's... um, I mean, what that what they're saying there is that the depression scale and the extroversion scale are not fully linked, mm-hmm. right? It's not like their correlation is like 0.9. Mm-hmm. It's like both of them are improving, but for, because they're measuring different things. Yeah. All right. We are at the end of this episode and um, I hope that you have enjoyed this big five series. It is just really awesome to put this out there to you guys hopefully you find it entertaining fun uh and also educational where you're kind of like okay that's kind of where i am and huh i can take that away from my own life and now i have this sort of way of thinking about people a little bit differently thinking about people in terms of their different personalities that they're different than myself and that you know my personality and their personality can kind of uniquely um, lead to either different good things or different things that might be a little bit more tri- trial oriented. Um, and maybe, you know, countertransference, right? How does countertransference sort of spark up when you have someone who's very different personality than your own? So I will leave it here. And if you want, go to the website. You can download the PDFs for these episodes and dig into them a little bit more. The PDFs do have more information than the actual episodes. So I hope you find that educational as well. 